Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, it is a joy uh, to come together in your presence, O oh Lord, to know more about you, to read about you, to, to read from your word, and to, Lord, hear uh, what you have uh, in store for us today. And so, rest of the time, we submit into your hand, Lord, uh, take control over it, and we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, as you speak, may our uh, hearts are open, may our understanding is enlarged, O oh Lord God, so that it will transform our life. Thank you, Lord, once again. We submit the rest of the time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um. So, very good evening to all those who have joined a little later. Uh, as, you, uh, as we have shared previously, that uh, apart from bringing the, the scheduled Bible study topics that the three of us bring, which is myself, uh, Pastor Dan and Pastor Praveen, we would also uh, invite this time some of the special uh, speakers that is from NMT and time to time Mr. Franklin Poppins joins us. And then we'll also bring some of the videos from um, GCI, our own website, uh, which is the series called You Are Included. And today uh, we are bringing one of the video uh, from the GCI International uh, series, You Are Included. This is where our uh, host for today, Dr. Michael Fazil, he will interview Dr. C. Baxter Kruger. He is the theologian, founder, and the president of uh, organization Pericoresis. And personally, I love to hear him whenever he speak, uh, though, uh, he, um, though he is a theologian, but when he speak, he speak just like you and me, and he relates to to, he, he brings the whole uh, God the Father, God the Son, and the whole, God the Holy Spirit in such a way that uh, for it's very e easier for the common people to relate uh, and, 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 and identify. So today he is going to talk about uh, goodness of God and where is God in the darkness uh, period of our life. And in this video, he is going to talk, of course, we will see, but he talk about two very important aspects that I would like to bring before so that when he bring, you could put a little focus. One is about forgiveness. Uh, and second is about the very goodness of God that we see around everywhere, not just within the children of God, but within the entire creation, number two. Number three is the presence of God among us. So those three things, uh, as he talked, just have a focus and then after the video, we'll discuss more about it, what he could mean, what how we could uh, possibly implement in our lives. So let me share my screen and we'll start. The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, author and lecturer Dr. C. Baxter Kruger talks about the goodness of God and our moments of darkness. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. When unbelievers are good, where does that come from? I think that's a fantastic question. Uh, if you grew up like I did with Calvinism, then you would look at people that are outside of the church and say, that's not really goodness. Don't know what it is, but it's really depravity because there's, it's really sin. But if you pan back to the Trinitarian gospel, you realize that Jesus has included the whole human race in his life with his Father and in his anointing in the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we ought to see the fruit of that inclusion in people, whether they have worked it out theologically perfectly yet or not. And I think that gives a much better perspective because what you're looking at is the love that the Father, Son, and Spirit share with us freely, and they're not concerned about getting credit all the time. They share that with us so that we can be filled with their music, and we can experience their life and their love in our families. And, and the Holy Spirit's mission is now to bring clarity to that, not to create it, but to bring clarity to it. Jesus says in John... Sorry, the volume is okay, right? Perfect. Let me in see if there is more. Yeah, it's okay. a, a little bit I, might be helpful. Yeah, that's why I am at full. So try to increase the volume 
of your mic uh, the the six speaker here it's full my how to increase uh, uh, sachin when you increase the changes only in your device yeah so hold on all of us Just have to in, in, put full in our own devices We'll start, yeah. Let me just go a little behind, yeah. Where does that come from? I think that's a fantastic question. Uh, if you grew up like I did with Calvinism, then you would look at people that are outside of the church and say, that's not really goodness. Don't know what it is, but it's really depravity because there's, it's really sin. But if you pan back to the Trinitarian gospel, you realize that Jesus has included the whole human race in his life with his father and in his anointing in the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we ought to see the fruit of that inclusion in people, whether they have worked it out theologically perfectly yet or not. And I think that gives a much better perspective because what you're looking at is the love that the Father, Son, and Spirit share with us freely. And they're not concerned about getting credit all the time. They share that with us so that we can be filled with their music and we can experience their life and their love in our families. And, and the Holy Spirit's mission is now to bring clarity to that, not to create it, but to bring clarity to it. Jesus says in John 12, I have come as light into the world so that you may not remain in your darkness. Because he's included us, we're in the dark about it, and Jesus has come to give light and sends the Holy Spirit to convict us so that we can begin to know what's going on. So that goodness comes from the only circle of goodness in the universe, and that's the goodness of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Whether or not people can give you a theological account for that or not, um, that's the way I see it. So by the same token as, as uh, all goodness that there is comes from, that's from right. God, love comes from the love relationship. The so Father, the Father, Son, and Spirit, truth, goodness, life, beauty, music, harmony, these things come, come out of the Father, Son, Spirit relationship and are shared with us and are seeking to express themselves in our lives. Which illustrates the point that when we're good, when goodness comes through us, it's not our goodness. This is God's goodness. He gets the credit, not us. In terms of origin, it is really important to realize that the goodness, that burden, um, I remember several, it comes from the Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, several years ago, I had a pastor friend that called me and there was a tragedy in the congregation. I think a father had died and left three or four or five kids and mother, the whole church was just overwhelmed with burden for this family. And the pastor called me and he said, I don't understand Baxter. He said, where is God in all this? Here we are feeling this burden. I feel this burden. And where is God in all this? And I said to him, um, I said, number one, yeah, you're asking two questions. The first question is, why did God let this happen? And I don't think anybody has the answer to that. And then the second question is, Given that this man died, where is God in the midst of all this suffering and pain? And I looked at my friend, I said, hang on here a minute. Are you actually suggesting to me that this burden, this overwhelming burden that you feel for this family in your congregation feels, are you suggesting that that has its origin in you? That you are this good of a person, that you are burdened this deeply for this situation? Or could it not be that he is the one who is burdened and he shares his burdens and his joys with us all? And we are involved in participating in the unfolding of his concern for this particular family or this particular fold of sheep. And that makes way more sense to me. Otherwise, we have to take credit for it. And then we think it's really us. And then our burden's better than your burden. And we, we have creativity better than your creativity rather than seeing as all of a piece and being able to celebrate that and help people participate in it. That makes a lot more sense to me. Let's talk about for a second, uh, you're, yeah, I know you're working on a novel. We've talked about that before. Is there anything about that that you could share with us, a little tidbit or uh, preview? I will tell you how it starts. And uh, this, the, I have a recurring dream, in, I'm one of the characters in the novel, I have a recurring dream. And in my dream, I'm in the woods. And I don't know if I'm hunting or why I'm there, but I'm standing looking at a farmhouse that's old, 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 like 100 years old, and it's hardly anything left there. A couple of cypress plants, a little piece of what would have been a window, and one 
um, rafter that looks like it's, it's being held in midair suspended. And I don't know where I am and what I'm doing. And I'm standing there, and this thing is so old, there's, there's trees and vines and bushes growing up in the inside of it. And I'm looking through this little window in my dream, and I suddenly see a green ghost, radar green, weird green. And it's looking from behind the tree inside the house at me, and it doesn't want me to see it. And it's terribly, horribly sad. Like, it, it makes me almost heave to feel the sadness of this thing. And then I always wake up. And I wake up with this, this feeling of this horrible sadness. And so that's the way the, the, the story starts. And then I actually do go hunting. And I shoot a deer. And I go get it. And it gets up and runs off in the woods. And so I'm chasing this deer, trying to find it, because it was a big buck. And I don't want to listen to the rest of my life to people abusing me about not being able to kill the big, the big deer. So I'm running through the woods. Then I crawl through the woods. And I come up under this tree. And I'm thinking, trying to find this trail. For, to the deer, and all of a sudden, there's the farmhouse. And it's not a dream, it's real. And then I'm sitting there wide-eyed and stunned um, and trying to figure out what the world is going on, and the ghost appears. So long story short, I go home. I'm trying to figure out what this is about. 3.30 in the morning, I get a phone call from a man in, in Australia whose daughter's in trouble. She's read some of my books. She wanted to talk to me. What's happened? She tried to kill herself. Why'd she try to kill herself? She's in, incredibly sad. Some green monster, some green creature keeps hang, hanging around the shed and makes her feel incredibly sad. So the whole question then is, what is this thing? Where does it come from? And how in the world can its sadness come on me and her? And how are we going to get to grips with this? So from there, I'm having conversations with my old professor in Scotland, who's, who's now in glory, but he gets resurrected in the book. And we have a long conversation about some of this. And I talk to people in Australia and the people around the country, and I'm trying to pull together um, an answer to find out, because it's not a minor, it's not a, a theological uh, question. This is a, this is a gut-wrenching question. We've got to find some solutions to this, that this girl could die, and I could too. And so that's, that's the basis of the book. It works all the way through towards... Um, a resolution. I am introducing all of the concepts that are in my other books, but almost in reverse. The concept of perichoresis sharing in Christ's life. Here the question is, how does the green creature sadness be, be shared with me and this other girl? So you got a timetable on it? Is there i I'm going to finish it. <laughs> how close are you? I'm two-thirds done now. And, um, I'm planning on going back and spending uh, as much of December as I can to finish it up. And then I'll go through oodles of editing and whatever uh, along the way, but we'll see. So what moved you to uh, to want to start the project? Ever since I finished Across All Worlds, uh, the very end of that book is a narration of a, a, a discussion that a man has with Jesus. He, he thinks he kills himself. He wakes up, he's not dead. He meets Jesus, and they have a long conversation. And that was one of the easiest things I've ever written. And ever since then, I wanted to take that idea and write it uh, as just a great story. I wanted first and foremost to be a story that's just a great read. But underneath it is all this, the message and the truth and the insights that have been given over a period of time. So that book was finished in like 2003. And um, I've been thinking about it ever since, but I did not have the particular plot line that I was looking for. And I was sitting uh, one night here six, eight weeks ago, and it just sort of hit me where I need to start. So I sat down and did the first 15, 20 pages, just right there. just whoop. And then uh, I've been working on it ever since. Well, we'll look forward to seeing it. Yeah. It's a ripper. <laughs> Let's talk about Across All Worlds, uh, Jesus Inside Our Darkness. What, uh, what lies behind this book? That book is where the life and light and love of the Father, Son, and Spirit theologically outlined and the trauma of human life and brokenness meet. And I'm trying to help uh, 
I was, I mean, this is in some ways the story of my life, how Jesus meets us in our darkness, not in our theological Sundayanity, but he meets us where we really are. And that scares us because the minute he comes showing up in our darkness, then it, when we begin to know this is darkness. I remember years ago when my wife and I um, were first married and we got into a debate about the, the color of the apartment walls. And I'd say, well, look, I mean, they're obviously white. And she said, no, they're off, they're off white. I said, no, they're white. So I snagged a piece of typing paper, walked up and just confidently slapped it upside the wall and instantly knew that they were very off-white. The walls were very, I went in close. So I think when Jesus comes to us to meet us, to love us in our darkness, his light shines and we suddenly know that no matter what we want to call what we've been living, this is darkness and this is death, this is not light. So there's a crisis that happens. And this book's about Jesus meeting us in that crisis and loving us so, because he wants the broken parts of us to come to know his Father's love. And he's determined to get inside of that in the Holy Spirit. So that's the, in some ways, it's a sequel to Jesus and the Undoing of Adam. And there's another paper called Bearing Our Scorn, Jesus and the Way of Trinitarian Life that follows that book. And so that's almost a trilogy. And that, that paper is available on our site for free right now. And that's um, thegreatdance.org. Yeah, go to, go to thegreatdance.org and it'll take you to the, to the mothership. In the, in the book on page 29, you begin chapter 5 with, with this. Reconciliation is not about Jesus suffering punishment so that the invisible, faceless, and nameless God up there somewhere can forgive us, which is very much in the back of the minds of, of many people. It is about the, for, the Father's forgiveness in action, entering into our estrangement and its hell, penetrating the fundamental problem of sin, as James Torrance would say, the, the Father does not have to be conditioned into being gracious. And you say there is no sense in which he needs to be coerced in order to forgive, which right. is so much. We, we, when we pray, we, we, it's like we beg, right. and we're not sure he'll forgive us, so we beg some more, and we keep on saying it until we finally get it out in some way that kind of almost convinces us that maybe that was good enough, like we're asking the boss for a raise or something. Forgiveness is first you write, overflowing out of the way in which the Father, Son, and Spirit love one another. From this forgiveness arises passion for it to be known and received. That's right. That, that to me is at the core of a proper view of reconciliation and atonement. Adam and Eve sinned. They fell. They hid from God. They hid, and, and to me, they, they had already, in, in falling, they had already become ashamed, and then they projected their shame onto God. They become guilty. They projected their guilt onto God. And so they're creating a mythological deity in their heads, and that's who they're hiding from because the Lord is the greatest philanthropist in the world, and how on earth could you possibly think evil of the Lord who had created all of this and given this to them, but in two seconds they go from being believers in the goodness of the Lord to thinking he, to actually believing he is the, the enemy to be avoided at all costs. So for me, the question from Genesis 3 all the way through the book is how is the Lord actually going to reach Adam and Eve in their darkness and in the bushes? And so forgiveness is not about how can we do something to get God off our backs or change God. That's the whole fallen mind's view of forgiveness. Forgiveness happens, um, the Father, Son, and Spirit forgive us the minute that we sinned and that we failed but they see that we can't receive that, that we can't believe that, that we're not about to say, okay, I've been forgiven. I want to have a relationship again. So they're, they're trying to find a way to take that forgiveness and earth it inside of us in our darkness so that we can actually experience it. And they're not going to rest. It was just some legal fiction where the Father says, okay, Jesus, enough suffering. I forgive them. Because that doesn't, that doesn't do a thing for Adam and Eve in the bushes. They're still scared to death. There's no communion. So forgiveness, and J.B. is right about this, forgiveness is first, and then comes a determination on God's part, on Father, Son, and Spirit's part, that we actually get to the place to where we can receive it and experience it as forgiveness. So the whole, the whole Bible is, is about that passion, uh, to incarnate the forgiving love of the Father, Son, and Spirit, so that we actually can get to the place where we can experience 
that love as love and forgiveness that it is. And we've turned the whole thing upside down in the Western world with our legalisms. It's pathetic. It's terrible. So the gospel is really about restoration of relationships, not about keeping laws and rules. It's, not, it's completely about relationship. Always has been, always will be. We're the ones that have created this, this system where we think somehow God needs to be changed. I think the entire Old Testament sacrificial system was never for God's benefit. It was never designed to placate and anger God. It was always designed to let Israel know that there is a way of forgiveness here and just long enough so that we could have a little bit of relationship. And in the end, the, the guilty conscience was never addressed in Israel's sacrificial system. And it's addressed in Jesus because the way he comes to have a relationship with us in our, in the way he deals with our guilty conscience, he actually allows us to dump our guilt on him. And we brutalize him and humiliate him, and he accepts us thereby meeting us as we actually are in our brokenness. And he can deal with the guilty conscience because he's standing inside it with his love for Papa and with his love for the anointing in the Holy Spirit. That seems to me to be the heart of the early church, although it's a very modern way of saying it. Uh, it's not an early church way of saying it. It's just, but it's, it's the same values, the same understanding, I think, of the early church. Non-legal, relational, passionate about adoption. We're going to do this. Yes, we're going to in confusion. Of all the books that, uh, that you've written, is there one that you can point at and say, well, that's the one that, that gave me the most satisfaction and I felt like I really got across, I'm sure all of them have a degree of that, but is there one special one that stands out to you? If you force me to say, and I would say that the little book, which is originally two chapters, but the InterVarsity edition of Parables of the Dancing God is a little pocket book. It, it says, it cuts into the Western legalistic vision of God and helps people see the goodness of Jesus' Father. And in the end, that's, that's the whole gospel to me. So if you, if you force me to pick one book, I would pick that one. Um, and then I would pick sections in other books. Like the first chapter of God is for us, I think is probably everything I've ever known crammed into one little sequence on adoption and eternal purpose and and then the the book um, Home is on John fourteen twenty, which is my favorite verse. It's about what we're really longing for and to, to, to participate in the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. In some ways my favorite of all is the secret because it was the hardest thing I ever wrote and it's like I was determined to get it in twenty pages, which is way more difficult than the like three hundred page book. Um there's sections in the Cross All World, sections in the Great Dance, but if I had to pick one, one book, it would be The Parable of the Dancing God, which, by the way, is now in, in Portuguese and Chinese, and it's being translated into uh, Spanish, and it's already been translated into German, but we're getting that translation verified. It just has a life of its own. Now, you call it Parable of the Dancing God. Mm -hmm. And then and also your, your other book, um, The Great Dance. Right. Um, You'd think I was a dancer. Huh, yeah. Brother? How does the word dance figure in in these, uh, in, the, in these titles? Well, I mean, the story of the prodigal son, the shocking, stunning part of the story is the father's love for the boy, and he's embarrassing himself by running, which you don't do in that culture as an, an elder statesman. And he, he's dancing in joy over the return of his son. So I just thought that's a was originally a sermon parable, I mean, the dancing God, because the whole story is about who God really is and what Jesus is in conflict with the Pharisees. And he's saying, look, guys, you're hurting these people by telling them that my father's like this and this and this, and you're wrong. Sit down and be quiet. I'm going to tell you some stories here about who God really is and what God's really like. So that's, that comes to me as just a, a, an obvious way of talking about the, the God, the father in this story here. He's a dancing God. And, uh, and then when this, some years later, I wrote The Great Dance. I was That's a sweeping panoramic book that goes from, you know, why God made us, who we are, what's going on, how our lives work in the light of the Trinity, um, that God is Father, Son, and Spirit created us to share in that adoption and those main themes. And I was looking for a central metaphor that could capture some of that. 
Um, and that phrase, the great dance, is used in various places in history, uh, particularly, though, in, in a couple of places in C.S. Lewis, where he calls it not the great dance, but a, a kind of drama or dance, where he talks about we are going to be filled with the three-person life of the Trinity. That's at the back of um, mere Christianity. Uh, some people think that I'm that I'm that the word perichoresis means dance, which it actually doesn't. But some people translate it that way, so there's some confusion there. Uh, T. T. F. Torrance asked me about that, and he said he didn't understand. He was he said you don't need to, you know, he didn't like the concept of the great dance and the use close to it with perichoresis because that seemed it seemed like I was supporting the view that perichoresis means a great dance. It it doesn't. It means Mutual indwelling, it means creating space for one another and dwelling in one another. But anyway, that is just a metaphor that came to me. Sure. It seemed like it worked on many levels with different people. Yeah. Old new, the Baptists don't particularly like it. but <laughs> um, Well, the prodigal son, uh, when he comes home, and the, and the first thing the father does is give him all the emblems of sonship right. while he's expecting it, or only barely hoping for slave ship right. so he can get a meal. He gets the shoes, he gets the ring, He's the embraced robe. the robe. He's the son, and the celebration is a dance. It's a, a party's thrown. It's a huge one. Yeah, and I mean that. So that emerges there, and in this one, it's just was I was thinking, trying to think of a, a single, image that captured something of the the part of, uh, the heart of that book, and so I came to that and was developed and grown from that sense. I think it's Madeline Engel and others have used the uh, analogy of uh, the great harmonies, the, the the songs of the of the universe, the right. harmonies of the stars, or however Spheres. she puts it, that uh, depict a, the similar kind of a concept of this everything working together and uh, being part of the great. Uh, well, there's one. There's a book God. on physics called the Cosmic Dance, where he says in his book that. Physics has come to know that the, uh, the the Newtonian model, the universe is like a great, huge organized machine, uh, is a metaphor that doesn't really work anymore. It's not the way the universe really is. He says scientists have come now to see that the universe is more like a great dance, and that's the actual words that he uses. Um, so it's 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 been around. It's a it's a concept that, uh, but I I wanted something that captured the the, the vitality and the beauty and the goodness of the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit um, and help them see that that's why they made us is that we could be part of it. And to find a single metaphor is hard to do. Sure. Well, all Maybe the more. most beautiful things that, that human beings experience, you can look at that give you joy, whether it's a beautiful panorama, a, a wonderful scene, the night sky, um, and you can see beauty, you can hear beauty in great music and and experience movement in and dancing is something everybody can do. I mean, not everybody can play great baseball or, or racquetball or whatever. Dancing is something that everybody can do, regardless of your skill level. Everybody can sway to the music, tap their foot, get into the movement, feel like they're a part of a dance, and the. To me, the beauty of it is that that all those good things we can experience, and and they're they're all in the context of if, of sharing it with others. You you look at a great thing and you think you think of the people you care about the most. You know, boy, I wish my wife could see this, or boy, I wish uh, you know I know who would really like to see this. And we take pictures so we can share them with other people. It's like I I can't take this in alone. I've got to, uh, this is something that's bigger than me. But all this is built into the fabric of the universe mm. uh, by the author of the universe, who is in this dynamic love relationship that's a, of a movement, an interpenetration that, that never ceases. And the, the great dance is the picture. I mean, it's, a, it's an image that helps us think of vitality and music and movement and life. It helps us begin to realize that this is what's going on inside of us. It's not necessarily just, you know, dancing, dancing. It is a vitality. And in fact, in the very beginning of the book, I talk about the river of living water. 
that seems to be flowing through all of life that I experienced when I was 12 years old on my bicycle, that I knew playing baseball, that I knew in romance is something ancient and vast and deep and beautiful that's running through the middle of all this, that all of this is a part of. And then I, in time, I came to call that not just the river of living water, but to call that the great dance. And really, it's just saying that's the life of the Trinity. That's the river running through it all is the life of the Trinity and the music of the Trinity, the beauty of the glory, the goodness, the life, the, the fellowship, the camaraderie. That's what's been given to us in Jesus, the great dance of light, and it's seeking to come to expression in, in millions of, of ways in us as persons, unique ways as persons. And it's the Trinitarian life. It's the great dance. It's the river of life that flows from um, the Father-Son-Spirit relationship. And isn't that where we feel the joy? Yes. When we feel joy, as opposed to, say, happiness or, or a temporary sense of, 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 of pleasure in something, but a, a sense of abiding joy comes through from, from that place. Yeah, it's the same as we were talking about, um, well, with respect to... Um, our participation and our um, sharing in the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit doesn't look the same way for everybody, but this is the source of it. This is, it's going to be, with some people, it's going to be passion for whales, and some people it's going to be, you know, uh, passion for their families, and fatherhood and motherhood, making things, caring for people, being a human person engaged in caring for the poor. Um, this is all the ways in which that life of the Father, Son, and Spirit is being shared with us, and we're expressing it. In, in, a, in unique and diverse ways. And learning to see that for what it really is is not just a bunch of, you know, some people being good and therefore because the Save the Wells people care about the wells and the rest of us don't, they're therefore better than the woman who cares about making bread for her neighbors. And vice versa. And a lot vice of, versa. A lot of times if somebody cares about seeing that dogs aren't mistreated in town, people will tend to say, well, what kind of a, there are people being mistreated in town. How can you care about the dogs? Right. And yet, there, it, everybody has their own That's journey, right. their path, and their makeup that allows them to be an expression in a certain way. That's right. And it's to be honest. If you can recognize it, then you can see the genuine burden of people who are concerned for whales and the burden of the people who are concerned for stray dogs and animals that are being abused. You can see the genuineness of that, which is the life of the Father, Son, Spirit, and you can see the abuse of that. But you can recognize it for what it is and not let it become a, a, a competitive superiority, inferiority kind of thing. No, I recognize who this is. Yeah. And I even recognize it uh, on Sunday morning in, in the preacher's stammering attempt to talk about grace. And I can hear it in a, a five-year-old daughter, a five-year-old girl's attempt to play the piano. It's not perfect. It's not, it's not professional. It's not technically correct. But there's something going on in it that's really good. It's really beautiful, and that's the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And you see it in the people's care for animals, and you see it in people that are growing crops in Kansas to feed the rest of the world and the people who are concerned for the whale. That's just the beautiful, that's where your eyes are opened and you start seeing Jesus and his Father and the Holy Spirit everywhere in all, all around us. And it's not, you know, I, I tell people, you got to take your church glasses off. you got to take your sacred, sacred sector humanity glasses off and look at what's going on the river of living water, the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit, the great dance that they share is in us and it's seeking to express itself in us and in our lives in very unique and beautiful ways. Honor it, respect it, relate to that, not to whether or not the person has degrees or education or uh, money or prestige or lives in this part of town or is this race or is this sex or whatever. Relate to the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit and honor that that you see emerging and help it, help it come forward because it's, it will be in a blessing for all of us when it comes forward. That's what I see. It's the same thing Paul said when he talked about Christ in us, the hope of glory. Exactly, Colossians, you know, where he says, uh, the mystery that's been hidden, God's made known and given to me to proclaim Christ in you. The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of, of, of being included in the glory of God is being given to us in Jesus because he's come to dwell in us and share his life with us. It just, there's a huge pressure that gets taken off of us and on our religious side when we realize that we're already included and that Jesus did this. And he just says, trust me and walk with me and you'll bear fruit in this that you can't even conceive of without even trying to bear fruit just from walking with me. 
There's a great re a relief of not having to be the person who gets everybody saved, who gets all, you know, I, well, I can, I'm free to be me. And I'm free to, to help the farmer be the farmer. And that means that Christ is in everything we do. We can take joy in his presence, even in our leisure activities, yeah. our sports, our whatever, whatever we're our cooking, our sitting down to eat. This, this striving that you see in so much Christianity is not Jesus. This is coming from darkness. This, this, the, the Christian life, there are times when it's painful. There's times when it's full of burden. But the striving to make these things happen for God, it's just, that's from the darkness. Jesus says, come to me when you're worn out from that, and I'll give you rest for your souls. And come walk with me, take my yoke on, my yoke on you. I'll show you how to have some fun here and get some stuff done. I'll show you how you can get water and I can change it into wine. Now you can go try that all you want at, you know, at home, but you're not going to get from the water to the wine because that's where what he does. And he said, participate in me, walk with me. I'm gentle. I'm humble in heart. I'm not about servitude and all this striving and keeping everything right for God. That's just not how this works. You come walk with me, we're going to go fishing tomorrow. You come walk with me, uh, we may bake bread for your neighbor tomorrow or we may make a fishing lure, or we may write a book, or we might just sleep in, and we might care deeply about people who are in Thailand who are being trafficked off to kids that are being, you know, taken away and, and sent into, into slave trades, I mean, sex trades. We, we may get very involved in that. I got plenty of people I got involved, but you walk with me. I'm not going to wear, wear you down because it's my responsibility. I'm just going to give you a part in it. And it's beautiful. I mean, you'll get way more done walking with me this way than you will striving to get everything right for God and keeping everything right for God. It's like, man, that's sometimes I think why people are just so put off with Christianity. I mean, we talk about the joy of the Lord. You know, it's like, give me a break, man. Let's just have some a vision where we can recognize the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit emerging in people, and we want to help that. And we see how it's getting turned over here and we're opposed to that. What are we going to do about that? Let's ask Jesus what he's doing about it and participate. It's, it's just way simpler. It's not as complicated. No, and the straining and striving is, um, is very burdensome. It's very, very not Jesus. It's our fallen imagination. You've been watching. You're included. That was deep, and yet that is his simplicity to bring things into such a level that it is easier for uh, common people like you and me to, to correlate. And this is the second or third time that I had a privilege to go through that video. And now I think the rest of the time we can just uh, uh, dwell on some of the things that he talked about, perhaps what we understand about it, or how do we go about it. Uh, and, First thing I'll start and then please uh, jump in. Uh, first thing that I like which he starts with is all goodness come from God in all humanity. Uh, every other person who is good, every other person who has a concern. And then later part in the video towards the end, he gives a lot of example. Uh, how people share burden and how we should not uh, think one burden is stronger than other or compare. So what was your take before he could correlate that all goodness in every other person who is not even believers comes from God? What was your understanding before? What do you used to think? Where does that goodness come from? Your take, any comments? Yes, again. From above, and so <clears throat> naturally, all all goodness in man or anywhere is really coming from God. It is not our goodness. Mm -hmm.
Any other <coughs> addition? Oh, let me connect one thought. And I think um, this is sometime some of my atheist friends we are connecting to. It's that, look, you guys do something good. Other people are also doing good. So the 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 act of doing good uh, is not something special that you do. Whoever believes in God, it's those who do not believe also do it. It's those who follow other religions also do it. So what's so special of you doing good? You are also doing what is they used to say is um, what is that word? You are also doing good good work or good community work. There's nothing different in it. And so today after hearing this, I have an altogether different perspective of uh, how I see everybody doing good. Are you saying, Sachin, that uh, the atheist who does good is actually God doing good in him or through him? I do, absolutely. <laughs> uh, one thing he brings, uh, Dr. Kruger Baxter bring in the very start of this thing is that whole humanity is included. Uh, those who follow uh, Jesus, those who follow other gods, and those of us, some of the good friends who doesn't follow any other gods. I would like to do my input. Means the Bible itself said, right? God made man in his own image. So he gave that goodness while creating man. So in that process, so the goodness has come to humans, whether they believe Jesus as Lord or not. But man is made in God's image. So in that image, this goodness came. Yeah, very right. In his likeness. We have made. Thank you, Mano. Actually, as we talk about this, definitely, first of all, uh, I agree and believe that all the goodness in humanity, uh, it is um, uh, the uh, presence, I mean, it is from God, the, as Mano has said, being created in his image. Uh, it is because of God that there is goodness in entire uh, humanity. At the same time, just uh, I'm not speaking dogmatically, but this this is how my mind thinks about uh, when we talk about goodness. There are two kinds of good uh, good uh, things we need to consider. Number one, there is a universal goodness that comes from God. Uh, the, that is because of God empathizing with others and all. Second thing is there is a good and bad, uh, which is comparative again, which it is distinct for each person. But there's certain things are good in a particular culture. They are not good in the other culture. Certain things are good for me. They may not be good for you. So this goodness, there is good and evil. There is good and badness, which is there. This is actually, it comes from the fruit of knowledge of good and evil again. So there is an ultimate goodness, which is from God, that is in everyone. And there is this kind of goodness and bad. Certain times, like, you know, there are people uh, in history also we could hear sometimes uh, in the name of uh, uh, for greater good, people are doing something which is damaging to others. Like, in the, for example, uh, in the name of greater good, how many uh, developed uh, societies are damaging the tribal societies? You know, they're going and destroying the, those places and these are also there. So when we talk about goodness, we should be a little careful uh, with those words. Uh, we are not talking about these these kind of goodnesses which, are, which can be de uh, defined in comparison in culture in its context. But there is a universal goodness that is where a human can love another human 
a human can relate with another human a human can empathize with the pain of another human a human can feel uh, sympathetic to the person and uh, would like to extend the same love this is the universal goodness whatever we feel it is from god but in just because i believe something is good for the other other person or other community and i go and do it sometimes it can result uh, in the other person liking it for his benefit it can come sometimes it destroy them also we should not think in the, the we could we should not justify all those so called goodnesses and relate them to god so those goodnesses are not from god the real relational uh, genuine uh, love giving goodnesses uh, those are the goodness that uh, <clears throat> that is across all humans across all cultures god has implanted in them i that's that's a just a uh, point i feel to consider beautiful point uh, praveen uh, about a good that is good for all uh, no matter which culture no matter which thing and the other good which person defines it might not be the same for others or other culture and that we need to be careful of thank you for that the other thing he talked about is forgiveness forgiveness first come from god and then he talked little more to elaborate that then god steps into our darkness to provide a, to to his 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 company so that we can reconcile back to him we can restore the communion that was broken so both the things it is on from him forgiveness first from him the moment he sees that the sin has broken our communion with him and then he doesn't stay which was our typical understanding is that now i need to ask for forgiveness i need to step into a right this thing and then i will have a righteous relationship with god but instead dr kruger was he comes into our situation where we are and then help us to restore so what are your thoughts on that what's your reflection yeah that's that's a very good thought uh, sachin and uh, uh i remember back to saying that uh, god was not coerced into forgiving forgiveness came first just like love came first he didn't start loving us after the crucifixion <laughs> he loved us before the crucifixion and that's why the crucifixion but i think the quandary is uh well you know uh what is the crucifixion all about and many believe it is the the father was punishing the son or sin uh but i think uh, what we need to understand is suffering is the vengeance of evil in other words uh it's a manifestation of evil uh and god allowed the son to have evil to let evil have its way upon him it was not that the father was punishing the son but allowing evil to have its way uh and hence that was a loving act so the love and forgiveness came first just to you know put the sequence in the right order <laughs> but doesn't one have to uh, repent receive that forgiveness and even that repentance is provided by god <laughs> yeah that that's a good, good good point lots of people ask that yes uh, um repentance doesn't make god to forgive you repentance is your acceptance of the forgiveness that's already there mm. <laughs> that's how i look at it yeah good point mm -hmm. i guess so uh, what baxter is saying is little more even um, profound than what we usually understand what forgiveness is forgive uh, presently i'm thinking in this way um you can correct me also 
uh, forgiveness is not a prerequisite for God to accept us, or uh, for, but it is a prerequisite for us to accept God. Uh, it is not God who requires to forgive us so that he may accept us. But forgiveness is like a conduit through which he helps us to accept him. If there is no concept, for example, if there is no concept of forgiveness, do you, do you think that God cannot accept humans? No, he already accepted before any concept of forgiveness or these kind of things come. But forgiveness, these things are brought forth Otherwise, we won't be able to accept God. If there is no something called forgiveness, if I could not, if I don't, uh, sorry, if uh, God does not come to me and say, okay, Praveen, I forgive you, I won't be able to smile at him. I won't be able to come to him. But God doesn't require any of this forgiveness or any of this. Basically, he accepted me before any of uh, this forgiveness, repentance, all these kind of things we, which we, we conceptually talk about. But uh, all these are made for us, not for God. God, gee, Christ also did not die on the cross for God. The, that's why if Christ died on the cross, then the scripture should say God to repent, to change his mind about us. Because Jesus died before we were sinners, because Jesus died, and because of him, be his blood cleansed us. So he has to change his mind to accept us as righteous. That means God is repenting. Jesus did not die on the cross for God. Jesus died on the cross for us. That's why scripture uh, commands us and uh, encourages, uh, commands us in fact, to repent. Repent means change your mind. So when it comes to forgiveness also, uh, I feel it is not just, it should not be considered just uh, uh, some kind of prerequisite, but which is necessary uh, way through which only God can accept humanity kind of, it's not that. All these things are made for us. This forgiveness thing is made for us. The grace thing is made for us. Before anything called forgiveness or grace, already love is existing in God. Complete acceptance is existing in God. That is in the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. So, uh, grace and forgiveness come where there is a failure. So, this, the moment when we talk, think about these failures and all, all failures will be from our end, not from the perfect God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, all these things, forgiveness, grace, all these things are made by God for us so that we may accept it. So, I, I, I don't know if I could communicate properly, but I would like to say that it is much more deeper, much more profound than just considering the, uh, the concept called Forgiveness as a requirement for salvation. <laughs> yeah. Forgiveness, grace, his love, act of repentance is for us uh, to enter, re-enter back into communion with him which was broken due to our, our sin. He has never took out his love. He has never took out his offer of communion with us. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, if there is no other on the forgiveness, there's one very good thing he talked on about the Old Testament sacrificial system he talked about. What does it meant and what most of us under understood. So anyone would like to talk about it? He talked about what sacrificial system actually meant uh, uh, from his point of view. Uh, Pastor Sachin, can I can I come in? Yes, Bertie. Uh, it's not. Uh, sorry, it's I'm not answering your your question. It's about another issue, but with your permission. Uh, if it's related to today's studies, then you can come now, or else we'll come after the conclusion of the study. Would that be okay, Bertie? Yeah, it's just short and sweet. You know, the Bible scripture says, "Broad and wide is the way that." leads to destruction and many are there that go going. Uh, but narrow and straight is the way that leads to life and few are they that find it. Uh, in the light of uh, what Dr. 
uh, what back to Dr. Dr. Back to Mr. Baxter spoke and what we are discussing. Uh, this is a, like a wide, wide sway. You know, it's a uh, it's a broad sway of people uh, who would be you know not qualified, but you know would miss out on God's goodness or because of their you know hardness, unrepentant attitude. As we have been learning, you know that if you if you, you know the sin is uh, enemy of God, sin is enemy of us. But what would you say in the light of what uh, Dr. Baxter says? Will it does it have any bearing? Uh, you know, uh, will the majority <laughs> be doomed, uh, be eternally condemned, and it is the uh, the elect or the you know the few who will uh, enter into life? Talk about God's goodness and all. Uh, are these people even knowing that, or they're deliberate in you know ignoring it, or uh, and uh, you know even even directly what you call that you know uh, denying it and you know what you call uh, not accepting it in a deliberate way. Uh, would would it uh, this thing with talking about God's goodness, which is so so loving and so nice, and you know for all of us, uh, would it uh, as the Bible says, would be would a majority of people miss it uh, uh, because of the sin, because the sin nature that is in us, as we know, we have the sinful nature in us, and only through Christ's uh, sacrificial death and His resurrection, we are made, uh, we are re you know we are born of God and the Spirit, and we are remade into. Uh, uh, to conform to Christ and will bring us into eternal life. What my question is: Will the majority lose out on this, and just a few will be, you know, the elect, so to say, uh, will find life in God, the kingdom of God? Bertie, um, I think a lot of questions. But are you? Uh, is your question that a majority of the people who reject? the word of God or this or the gospel would be left out of God's plan uh, of salvation? Is that your question? Yes, that's my question. Yes. No, we are talking about God's goodness that flows, the trying God's, you know, love and indwelling of each other and their way of life. Then, you know, every, the good qualities and the goodness of God, which they share with each other flows on to into humanity and you know and it shows forth in different with different cultures different people even different religions okay. and okay. Uh, so, in the light of that what would you say okay so your question is if you reject uh, god's way which is his yeah. teaching would his goodness still apply to our lives or the majority yes. of life is it applicable to your and my life yes it does then it applies to everybody else's. In the sense, okay. I'll tell you, because he does not, if he has to weigh you and me down uh, because of, uh, because our, uh, our sinful nature or our ability to go back to the confinement of sin, uh, we would never be able to stand in front of him. But through Christ, uh, through Christ's uh, sacrifice, we are able to do that. So despite uh, so so despite us not being uh, in our daily life, not being still living the way we should be, yet his goodness is around us, is what I feel. Yes. Yes. But you want Sachin, to... can I please come? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Franklin. Yes. I'll ask him after that. Okay, sir, can, can you all, all hear me, please? Yes, yes. absolutely. Achha, achha, achha. Um, sir, uh, talking about goodness, uh, uh, I just want to tell that uh, Shanti ma'am gave an excellent sermon about a couple of years back. Uh, it was titled as Cosmic Truths. Now, uh, I'm trying to recall what, uh, what exactly she uh, explained, but uh, in the ancient world or in the medieval world, Christianity was defended on three points. Truth, beauty, and goodness. All truth is ultimately God's truth. All beauty is ultimately God's beauty. All uh, good goodness is ultimately God's goodness. Uh, they find their origin in God. Uh, maybe we can request Shanti to uh, redo this uh, uh, sermon as a Bible study presentation so, so that we can have a full-length discussion. 
noted, I will I'll uh, share your message and thank you for bringing that, Mr. Franklin Poppins. Mr. Uh, Pasadan, you were saying something? No, I think uh, uh, I was just trying to understand Bertie's question and maybe he wanted us to speculate how many would be saved, how many would be lost. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that. So, it's not that, you know, uh, the you know you just that the gods we are mentioning about you know what a beautiful uh, uh, interview that was uh, with Fiazel, Dr. Fiazel with uh, Dr. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean it just brings out the goodness and you know the uh, yeah. the great you know you know words cannot mention uh, cannot really uh, uh, get spoken of the greatness of our God and Triune God. But what about man? <laughs> what about man? Yeah. yeah. No. I was just uh, responding in a lighter vein. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, that's a speculation of, I mean, to say, realm of speculation. Uh, how many would ultimately allow the goodness of God to remain in them? And uh, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens. <laughs> um, yeah, before we just close, Bertie, one thought came to be. If we know who God is and what is his intention is, then we should be very uh, confident that he would go to any level to bring his creation and creature back in his fold. Because that was he is. That's what he is, a loving this who has extended the arm of uh, relationship uh, with him. And he would go to any level to bring that up. And I think that should give us a lot of confidence uh, and hope. Uh, not just us, to our friends and families who have not yet accepted, to our friends who are still rejecting after hearing over and over and over again. Yeah, and I think that's a wonderful hope. Uh, with this, we have already crossed the time by six minutes. But uh, again, uh, it is such a, a pleasure to have you all here. And which means once we are here, it also gives us a time to pray for each other. And as a tradition, we'll continue to pray for the pressing uh, needs that we have at this moment. And somehow uh, within our Bible study, health, uh, the topic of health is, uh, is, is, is on priority. So as we close in prayer, we will continue to pray for Mr. Anil Nagar, God's intervention and restoration in his health. Continue to pray for Surya Murthy uh, to find the right uh, medicine and the right way, time, place. Uh, Mr. Sanjeev Rao for, for restoration completely. Uh, Bertie for some of the uh, weakness that he often feels and any other needs that uh, any of our members have. Yeah. So, Sachin, uh, if yes. you can just also mention Ashwin from Mumbai. Mm -hmm. uh, he just called me for the study. He's writing a very important exam where he might get good employment. So he just asked if he can mention his request and prayer. Absolutely. We'll pray for Ashwin as well. Yeah. So if you would all join with me, we'll put all our requests in God's hand. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, what a loving, caring uh, God you are, O oh Lord. And what a privilege we have to call you our Father. And what a freedom we have through Christ by his spirit that, Lord, we can be one with you. And despite our shortcoming, despite our failures, despite our sinful nature, yet, Lord, through your grace, when by the work of the spirit, we can have constant communion open with you. And it is a, a, it is a reason for us to joy and thanksgiving, Lord. What a privilege people we are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word that you brought uh, through an interview by Dr. Michael Fazel with the Dr. Baxter Kruger, oh Lord. Thank you for all the uh, wonderful uh, comments and the inputs that we have received from people around here. And it is our prayer that you continue to work in our heart, oh Lord, so that our understanding is enlarged and we can become more and more like you. And Lord, it is also the time for us to bring what is in our heart, what is uh, what is being heavy on our heart, O oh Lord God, so that, Lord, you can take care and you can take control over every problem that we are going through now. And, Lord, today we would like to bring um, Mr. Nanil to your throne of grace and mercy. 
Lord, we want to thank you for your presence still with him, uh, restoring Lord God in many ways that we cannot see. But it is our prayer, Lord, that the uh, the direction that the medical experts are taking to diagnose what is wrong with him, Lord, we submit that into your hand. We pray for your favor uh, uh, in, in whichever things that he is doing so that if any appointment is needed at a faster level, if somebody wants to do some arrangement, Lord, let that happen, our Father. We submit him into your hand, Lord. At this moment, doctor don't know. But Lord, we pray that let your wisdom be upon them, Lord, as they diagnose our Father, you know the very, in every aspect of Mr. Anil Lagar, Lord God. And so we pray that you stretch your healing hand, O oh Lord. You restore him, our Father. You let him gain the strength, O oh Lord God. As he has lost so much of weight, Lord, we pray that whatever food he is able to intake, let that bring strength, O oh Lord. And we would live to see him, O oh Lord God, fully recovered, O oh Lord, joining with us so joyfully. So, Lord, we submit him into your hand. And Lord, Rekha also, as she is taking care of him, give us strength and all the help that she needs. We continue to thank you, Lord, for Mr. Surya Murthy, that we, through this channel, we get to see him, we get to interact with him, we get to fellowship with him, and we get to see how you are doing in his life, O oh Lord. And so I want to thank you for his life. We continue to submit, Lord God, his health into your hand. And Lord, we pray for your favor in for the hospital, the place where he would like to get the next treatment done. And Lord, until the time the, treat, uh, the, the treatment is planned, Lord, your restoration continue on him. Let the medicines he is taking be helpful. Thank you once again for Mr. Rao. Lord, for, for giving him strength to restore. Lord, we would like to see him fully restored, oh Lord God. Thank you again, Lord. We submit Bertie into your hands. Often he has some weakness, sometimes troubles, oh Lord. You strengthen her, Lord God. So your wisdom, your understanding and your strength be with him, <laughs> oh Lord. As he takes care, O oh Lord God. Our Father, at this moment, we bring Ashwin to your throne of grace and mercy. Lord, as he is giving an, uh, some of the entrance exam for some of the companies, which he feels is the very good company. Lord, at this time, we pray that uh, you give him peace so that all the preparation he has done, we'll be able to implement that in the paper. You give him wisdom. Your understanding be upon him. Let his memory be sharp and precise, O oh Lord God. And if that's the uh, job, that's a profile you have chosen for him, Lord, we pray that you give him all the favors in every step, O oh Lord God, so that he can be blessing to that new place. Thank you once again, Lord, for this evening. We submit all of us into your hand. We submit our known and our uh, not shared need with you, O oh Lord because you know everything. And so, Lord, thank you. We submit ourselves into your hand until we meet again. For you, all the glory and honor. We thank you and bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a...